the great white throne of God. It's a judicial judgment seat, which some scientists actually believe is located at the center of our universe. Now, I personally can't say for certain where the throne of God is currently located, but what we do know is that the Lord has already revealed his throne to the prophets and the poets who gave us the Bible. For example, uh, the prophet Micah saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and he saw the host of heaven standing at his right hand and at his left. King David also informs us that the Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. Job also tells us that the Lord covers the face of his throne with a cosmic nebula, which is a space cloud. And I think that's very interesting. Now, based on Bible verses such as these, there are many who believe that the great white throne of God is hidden somewhere within the Orion Nebula. And while this is nothing more than pure speculation, what we can say with all certainty is this. Our solar system is currently on a collision course with the great white throne of God, wherever it is. And once this cosmic conjunction occurs, the heavens and the earth will flee from the face of the one who is seated upon that great white throne. Here in our time today, we're going to examine a prophecy that John presents us here in the revelation of Jesus Christ. And this prophecy points us to the day when the great white throne judgment begins to take place. And as we make our way through the verses that are before us today, we're going to learn, first of all, that the great white throne judgment begins with a resurrection. Secondly, we'll see that the great white throne judgment includes a retrospection. Thirdly, and finally this morning, we'll see that the great white throne judgment concludes with retribution. Well, with this as our outline, let's open our Bibles now to Revelation chapter 20, where we find the Apostle John. He's now describing the day of the great white throne judgment of God. As you make your way to Revelation 20, I want to continue setting the stage for our text today. And so it'll first help you to remember that we find ourselves in the section of this book, which is focused on the millennial kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And while it's true that the millennial kingdom will begin with the resurrection of the tribulation age saints, it's also true that the millennial kingdom will conclude with a second resurrection, which John describes here in this chapter. With this as our focus, if you would look with me here at Revelation chapter 20, we're going to pick up our study at verse 11 where John writes, Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the, and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, here in these verses today, we find John, he's describing the great white throne judgment, which is going to occur at the time of the second resurrection, which is the second of the two resurrections, which occur both at the beginning and then at the end of the millennial kingdom. And just to be clear, it's important for us to understand that this isn't the only judgment seat of the Lord Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, there are three different judgment seats that the Lord has revealed throughout the pages of his holy scriptures. And with this in mind, if you would hold your place here in the book of Revelation, I'd like you to turn with me to the New Testament book of 2 Corinthians, and I'd like you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. As you make your way to 2 Corinthians 5, I want to point out that there is a huge difference uh, between the meritorious evaluation of believers and the judicial judgment of unbelievers. And in order to explain what I mean by this, if you would look with me there at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I want to begin reading here at verse 6. <clears throat> here Paul declares, We are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. 
We are confident, yes, well, pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now, here in these verses we find Paul, he's describing something that he refers to as the judgment seat of Christ. And we must not confuse the judgment seat of Christ with the great white throne that John mentions in Revelation chapter 20. As a matter of fact, when John refers to the great white throne, he's actually using the Greek word thronos. Paul here, though, in 2 Corinthians 5 is using a different word. He's using the Greek word bima when he refers to the judgment seat of Jesus. Not only that, but the great white throne or the thronos of God is where unbelievers end up being punished for the sins they committed, while the bema seat of Christ, which we find here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, is where believers eventually are rewarded for the ways that we spent time serving our Savior. Now, in order to further grasp the rewards that believers are going to receive at the Bema Seat Judgment, if you would continue holding your place there in the book of Revelation, I'd like you to turn with me back one book to 1 Corinthians. As you make your way to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I want to remind you that the rapture of the church is going to occur just before the time of tribulation begins. And it's at that point in time, at the rapture of the church, when the bodies of every church age saint will rise up from their graves and as our spirit, soul, and body are joined together, we will find ourselves standing before the beam of seat of Jesus Christ and there we're going to receive the rewards that Paul is talking about here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. If you would look with me here at 1 Corinthians 3, we'll begin reading at verse 10. Here, Paul declares, according to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it, but let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Here in these verses, we find Paul helping the Christians there in Corinth to understand that the Bema Seat of Jesus is not a judgment of believers, but rather it's a judgment of the works done by believers. The believer themselves will not be judged whether they're going to be saved or not. No, those who end up standing before the Bema Seat of Jesus Christ, they've already been born again. They've already been forgiven of their sins. Now it's just a matter of rewarding them for the good works they did by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so the church age saint will end up suffering the loss of reward for the things that we did in the flesh but we'll also receive rewards for those things that we did in the spirit. But it's just important to understand that this is not a judgment of the believer, but rather of the works of the believer. Well, then after born again believers receive their rewards there at the Bema Seat of Christ, the Lord then returns to judge those who survive the time of tribulation. With this in mind, continue to hold your place there in the book of Revelation and turn with me now to Matthew chapter 25. And as you make your way to Matthew 25, I want to remind you of the fact that there will be those who will survive the battle of Armageddon, which is going to occur at the end of the Great Tribulation. And while some of them uh, will be Tribulation Age saints, other survivors, they will be those unrepentant unbelievers who end up being set apart for further judgment. As a matter of fact, if you would look with me here at Matthew chapter 25... I want to begin reading at verse 31. Here Jesus declares, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Now here in these verses we find... Jesus talking about the time of his second coming 
we see in verse 31 that this is the time when the Son of Man comes in his glory. And so this happens at the end of the tribulation. And he's informing his followers here about a divine division which is going to occur at the time of his second coming. It's at that point in time when our Savior will take the role of a a shepherd who is separating the survivors of the tribulation into two groups, namely his sheep and then also his goats. And then after he completes this separation, we learn that his sheep will enter into the millennial kingdom of Christ while the goats will be sent to Hades where they'll wait for the great white throne judgment of God, which we find John describing here in our text today. And so we see then, just to put it all together, the bema seat of Jesus Christ is going to occur after the rapture of the church. And while we're receiving rewards there in heaven after the rapture of the church, the world will then enter into a time of tribulation as seven years pass by of, of great tribulation here on the earth. And then at the end of the tribulation, the Lord Jesus will return and like a good shepherd, he will separate uh, the tribulation survivors into two groups. And in this way, he's going to invite his sheep into his millennial kingdom and he's going to detain the goats in the fires of Hades. Finally, at the end of the millennial kingdom, a second resurrection will occur as every unbeliever rises up from the grave. And then their works will be judged as they stand before the great white throne judgment. Now with this in mind, I'd like you to turn with me back to Revelation chapter 20. I wanna take a closer look at this throne that John describes. If you would look with me again there at verse 11. Here John declares, then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. Without debate, this is an ominous scene as we consider the way in which the earth and the heaven will flee from the face of the one who is seated upon this throne. But it's also important to understand that the word white here isn't speaking of like the absence of color, but rather we're talking about this brilliant, pure light. That's what the original Greek word speaks of. This this throne is great, bright, pure. Based on this, we can see that the Lord Jesus is going to be seated upon this throne of perfect purity. It's going to be pure brilliance. And this is going to be the basis for his judgment. He's going to judge the works of those who rise up from the grave at the time of the second resurrection. And you better believe that this judgment will result in a resurrection of eternal condemnation. In order to prove my point, if you would hold your place here in the book of Revelation and turn with me to the fifth chapter of John's gospel account. As you make your way to John chapter five, I wanna take a moment to point out that every person is eventually going to receive a brand new body. Every single person, whether a believer or an unbeliever, we're all eventually going to receive a brand new body and that brand new body will exist for the rest of eternity. Born again believers will receive their resurrected bodies at the time of the rapture. Tribulation age saints will receive their resurrected bodies at the time when Christ returns to establish his millennial kingdom. Lastly, those who have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ, they're going to receive their resurrected bodies at the end of the millennial reign. That's right, at the end of the millennial reign, every unbeliever will experience what's called the second resurrection. As a matter of fact, if you would look with me here at John chapter five, I wanna begin reading at verse 24. Here the Lord Jesus declares, most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Most assuredly I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the son of God and those who hear will live. For as the father has life in himself, so he has granted the son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man. Do not marvel at this for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. 
Here in these verses, we find the Lord Jesus. He's describing these different resurrections, one which leads into everlasting life and one which leads into condemnation. And as we consider the difference between these two resurrections, it's important to understand that the resurrection of life is going to be enjoyed by those who believe in him and trust in him, while the resurrection of condemnation is going to be endured by those who rejected his free gift of grace. And as we consider what the Lord Jesus was saying, there should be no doubt in our minds that those who reject Jesus will not only receive a resurrected body, which will live forever and ever, but they're also going to be judged according to their own works. Now, this brings us to our second point, because listen, the great white throne judgment not only begins with this resurrection, but this judgment also includes a time of retrospection. With this as our focus, if you would, let's make our way back to Revelation chapter 20, because here we find the apostle John, he's describing that day when the works of every unbeliever will be examined. If you would look with me again at verse 12. Here again, John declares, I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Now here in these verses we find John, he's helping his audience to understand that the resurrection which will occur at the end of the millennial kingdom, it includes every unbeliever who has ever lived. For example, again in verse 12, John tells us that the, the dead, both small and great, were standing before God doesn't matter how big you were, whether you were small or great, you're going to be there. Actually, small and great refers to uh, those who are rich and powerful, as well as those who are poor and powerless. It won't matter how wealthy you were. And the reason why this is important is because those who are wealthy in this world uh, can quickly bribe a judge and, 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 and escape certain punishment. Those who could afford to pervert justice while they were here on earth, well, they're eventually going to find themselves standing before a great white throne, which has a righteous judge who can't be bullied, he can't be bought off, he can't be bribed. No. The poor and the rich will both stand before the great white throne judgment of God if they rejected God's grace. They're going to find themselves being judged according to their works. And so both small and great are there. Not only that, but John also tells us that the dead are going to rise up from every location. As a matter of fact, look with me again at, at verse 13. There we learn that the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up, up the dead who were in them. Now, here in this world, if someone is lost at sea, they're truly lost. Uh, you know, rarely do we recover the bodies of those who, uh, you know, die at sea. But that's not the case with God. God doesn't have a problem locating the remains of those who were lost at sea. For us, they're lost. For God, they're not. There eventually is going to be a day when the sea will give up the dead uh, who are in it. And, and also death or, or the grave. Those who were properly buried in the grave or those whose ashes have been scattered here on the earth. God knows how to raise up the remains of those elements so that uh, those bodies can be restored and renewed and returned to their soul. And then they'll stand before the great white throne of God. The souls which have been waiting in Hades will be rejoined to their resurrected bodies and they will find themselves facing the righteous judge of heaven and earth. Sadly, this resurrection is going to be a righteous retrospection of the works that every unbeliever is guilty of. In order to explain what I'm saying, if you would, let's look again at verse 12, because there again, John tells us that he saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. Books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Here in this verse, we find John describing this moment when the Lord uh, begins to open up a bunch of books. And while the bulk of these books include a written record of the wicked works performed by every unbeliever for all of time, uh, before we get into all that, I just want to take a moment to consider the book of life that John mentions there in the middle of verse 12. Now, in order to understand what is this book of life, uh, 
I'd like you to hold your place here in Revelation chapter 20. And I want to turn back to the beginning of this book. If you would, let's turn back to the third chapter of Revelation. You see, it's back in Revelation chapter 3 where we find the Lord Jesus. He's mentioning this book of life to the Christians who are at the church in Sardis. As a matter of fact, if you would look with me at Revelation chapter 3, I want to focus your attention on verse 5. Here Jesus declares, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Now here in this verse, we find Jesus assuring the saints there in Sardis that he's not going to blot their names out of the book of life because he tells them there that he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. And who is he who overcomes but he who places their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ this morning, then you have overcome this world by your faith in Christ. And according to Jesus, those who overcome will not see their names blotted out of the book of life. Those who trust in Jesus are those who have overcome by the blood of the lamb. Therefore, every born again believer here this morning can rest assured that our names will be found in the edited version of the book of life, which I believe is the Lamb's book of life. In order to understand the difference between the book of life and the Lamb's book of life, turn with me now to Revelation chapter 21. It's there in Revelation 21 where we find John mentioning this second book known as the Lamb's book of life. And with this is our focus, look with me there at Revelation 21 verse 27. There John describes the new Jerusalem and he gives us an understanding of who can enter into the new Jerusalem by declaring, there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, as we consider the difference between the book of life and the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb's book of life appears to be the register for the new Jerusalem, uh, you know, which uh, shows that the only people who have access to the new Jerusalem are those who are found in the Lamb's book of life. And while we aren't told specifically what the difference is between the book of life and the Lamb's book of life, it seems to me that the Lamb's book of life, it's the edited version of the book of life. And the reason why I say this is because the Lamb's book of life isn't mentioned until after the great white throne judgment where names are blotted out because of unbelief. Based on this, it's my conjecture that the book of life contains the names of every person ever born. As soon as someone is conceived, I believe their name is found in the book of life. But those who reject the Lord Jesus Christ will suddenly find their names blotted out of that book as they stand before the great white throne judgment of God. And the final version, after names are blotted out, that is the Lamb's book of life. The names of those who reject the love of the Lord Jesus Christ are blotted out as they face the second death. And what we're left with is the register of the new Jerusalem. It might even be a phone book if we need phones. Well, if I'm correct about this, the Lord Jesus is going to open the book of life at the time of the great white throne judgment in order to blot out the names of every unbeliever from that book. And not only will he, will he open up that book of life in order to engage in this final editing, but he's also going to open up all these other books, which are the record of the wicked works of every unbeliever. And with this in mind, let's turn back to Revelation chapter 20. I want to focus your attention there on verse 12. Here again, John declares, I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And notice here, the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Based on this, we can see that the wicked works of every unrepentant unbeliever, uh, they appear to be kept in these books and therefore their works will be examined at the time of the great white throne judgment. Now, I can't tell you how long this judgment will last. I know that we're going to have the rest of eternity. And so maybe this is all real-time examination. Uh, this might be uh, the way that many of us used to listen to Pastor Chuck's sermons, you know, on play fast forward, you know, so that you could listen to them, but you could listen to them really fast. You know, and so maybe everything's going to happen fast forward. Maybe it's just going to happen in the blink of an eye. Uh, 
And it's just going to be a, a realization of what's recorded in those books just within a split second. I, I can't tell you how long this judgment is going to last. But what I can tell you is that there's going to be a level of retrospection where the Lord is showing every unbeliever what they're guilty of. And that's very important. Because if you stop the, uh, the, the average person on the street and ask them, hey, are you a pretty good person? What do you think they're going to say? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm pretty good. Per- I've never murdered anybody. You know, I, I wouldn't steal from my grandma. I'm a pretty good person. Yeah, most people think that we're just pretty good people. Well, yeah, as long as we're comparing ourselves to other fallen people. If I compare myself to other fallen people, then I'm better than some and not as good as others, but I'm not a horrible person. But when you compare us to the purity and the holiness of God, all of a sudden we recognize and realize how wicked we actually are. And while there are many who believe they're going to stand before the great white throne judgment of God one day and, and make an argument for their innocence, the righteous judge of heaven and earth will simply break out the books and say, let's examine how innocent you are. And with righteous retrospection, the Lord Jesus will remind them of every single sin that they ever committed. And listen, not only will the Lord Jesus present them with a record of all of their evil deeds, but also the thoughts and the intents of their hearts. This is precisely the point that Paul was making in Hebrews chapter 4, where he tells us that there is no creature hidden from his sight, but notice, all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Please understand I'm sure that we've all got secrets that we'd rather keep secret. Things that we've done wrong that we don't want anybody else knowing about. And maybe you've done a good job up until this point in your life keeping that hidden. But I'm here to let you know, it's not hidden to God. None of our sins are hidden to God. None of our thoughts or or desires are hidden to God. We are all naked and open before his eyes. And he is the one to whom we will eventually give an account. If this causes you to shudder, it should. It should. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, Solomon confirms this fact by assuring his audience that God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Please trust me when I tell you that there is nothing hidden from God. He sees it all, and he's able to judge it all. Now, as we consider the way in which the Lord will judge the thoughts and, and, the, and the deeds of every unbeliever, I can't help but to think about those people who uh, attempt to justify their sinful lifestyle by simply saying, only God can judge me. Maybe you've gone to somebody in an attempt to challenge them about some sin in their life, and they responded by saying, you can't judge me, only God can judge me. This has been a popular statement ever since... Tupac Shakur's final album where there was a hit track on there called Only God Can Judge Me. And in this song, he sings about sins that he's engaging in and and why he's justified to do it because only God can judge what he's doing. Sadly, it was eight months after the song was released when Tupac was shot to death. And listen, he, I'm certain, now realizes how true that song actually is. I'm certain that he realizes now that, yeah, only God can judge him and God is going to judge him. And God is going to judge every unrepentant unbeliever according to the works that they're guilty of. There's coming a day when every unbeliever will give an account for every word, every deed, every thought, and every desire. And while it's true that the great white throne judgment begins with a resurrection and is followed by a time of retrospection as, our, as the works of every unbeliever are examined, we should finally consider how the great white throne judgment is going to conclude with righteous retribution. But this is our focus. Let's continue to make our way through Revelation chapter 20 because here we find the apostle John. He's describing the righteous retribution which will eventually come upon every unbeliever. And if you would look with me there at verse 14. Here, John tells us that death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. 
And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now here in the final verses of this chapter, we find John, he's describing the great white throne judgment. He's describing the outcome as a time when both death and Hades are cast into the lake of fire. And it's interesting to note that he describes uh, this casting of death and Hades into the lake of fire. He calls it the second death. And that's interesting to me because the word death there and, and the word second death, that's the same Greek word. And so death dies. Death dies at this point in time. What does that even mean? What does John mean by telling us that death is going to die or there's going to be this second death? Well, in order to answer these questions, if you would hold your place here in the book of Revelation and turn with me to Daniel chapter 12. As you make your way to the 12th chapter of Daniel's incredible book, I want to take a moment to address the argument of those who teach a doctrine known as annihilationism. Just to be clear, those who embrace the doctrine of annihilationism, they would have us to believe that the second death is actually God's way of ending the suffering of those who will end up in the lake of fire. They can't imagine a God who would send people into eternal torment. And so for them, the second death, uh, what they would have us to believe is that this is God's way of just, uh, you know, letting someone just cease to exist so that their suffering can just end. They, they, they believe that the unrepentant unbeliever will simply cease to exist rather than to be tormented in the lake of fire forevermore. Now, I'll admit right up front that this doctrine would be much easier to embrace on an emotional level. I would much rather believe in annihilationism than eternal torment. And so just on emotion alone, I would say, oh yeah, sign me up for annihilationism. The only problem with that is that this doctrine is not a biblical doctrine. And so while it's emotionally more acceptable, it's biblically incorrect. In order to prove my point, if you would look with me here at Daniel chapter 12, I want to begin reading at verse 1 where Daniel declares, At that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since, the nation, uh, since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, Notice, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Here in these verses, we find Daniel pointing to uh, the time period that we call the tribulation when Michael shall stand up and, and help to defend the nation of Israel. And then after talking about this time of tribulation, he starts talking about this time period before and after the millennial kingdom, before uh, the righteous will resurrect those tribulation age saints will rise up to everlasting life. And then at the end of the millennial kingdom, we understand that there will be a second resurrection, which will result in everlasting contempt, which is another way of saying everlasting condemnation. Now, it's important to understand that the, the Hebrew word translated everlasting, it speaks of perpetual life. It's a word that refers to an unending future a future without end. That's what the word everlasting means. And in light of the meaning of this word, we must not fail to notice that he uses that word twice. Once to point to everlasting or unending life and the second time everlasting contempt. What this means then is that whatever period of time believers enjoy everlasting life, is equivalent to the period of time which will be experienced by those who endure everlasting contempt. Jesus confirms this point of view in Matthew chapter 25, verse 46, where he tells us that the goats will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into everlasting life. Just like Daniel, Jesus presents a parallel here between the time frame of those who end up in heaven and those who end up being cast into the lake of fire. If we're going to say that the, the life of those who end up in the lake of fire come to an end through annihilationism, then we also have to say the same thing about those who end up in heaven because it's the same time period. With that being the case, there's 
no biblical reason for us to believe that the second death results in the annihilation uh, for those cast into the lake of fire. And I would even go further to, to say that the second death, when death dies, is actually an argument for everlasting torment. You see, if death dies, then no one dies again. Death is cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, which means that those who are cast into the lake of fire won't be able to die because death is dead. Based on this, I believe there's good biblical reasons for believing that those who end up cast into the lake of fire will continue to suffer forevermore. Now, with this in mind, I'd like you to turn back to Revelation chapter 20. I want to take another look at verse 15 where John declares, anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. As we've considered the way that names are uh, going to be blotted out of the book of life, I think that we might uh, understand John to be saying this, that anyone whose name has been blotted out of the book of life will be cast into the lake of fire. Now that word cast was translated from a Greek word, which in this context refers to a forceful thrusting. It refers to a violent throwing down. It's for this reason that the scholars who gave us the New Living Translation, they render verse 15 in this way. Anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. It's a violent throwing. And it's there in the lake of fire where unrepentant unbelievers will find themselves receiving the righteous retribution for all of their sinful rebellions. With this in mind, if you would, let's turn to Romans chapter 2 where we find Paul. He's describing the righteous retribution of the Lord. And as you make your way to Romans 2, I want to take a moment to point out that the word retribution simply refers to the penalty and even the perfect punishment which fits the crime committed. And in order to grasp the reality of this righteous retribution, I would simply point you to the cross of Christ. You see, the cross of Jesus Christ is where God the Father punished Jesus for the sins of the world. Just grasp that for a moment. The cross of Christ is where the Lord Jesus received the righteous retribution which we all deserve for the sins that we've committed. He received the retribution of God the Father on our behalf. And so when you look at the scourging and you look at the crucifixion and you look at uh, the weight of the sins that, that were placed upon his shoulders and as you look at him crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We catch a glimpse of the righteous retribution that God the Father must pour out in order to punish sin. Sadly, There are many who reject the salvific work that the Lord Jesus accomplished on the cross. And what they might not fully realize is that by doing so, the unbeliever is choosing to receive upon themselves the righteous retribution of God's wrath. You see, God must punish every single sin. God must punish every single sin. And while he has poured out his retribution upon the Lord Jesus Christ, who received our punishment, those who reject that are saying, I'll, I'll take my own punishment. I'll, I'll receive my own retribution is what they're saying. Now, in light of this, let's consider how Paul pay, uh, puts it here in Romans chapter 2. If you would, let's begin at verse 5, because here Paul declares, in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds. Eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil of the Jew first and also of the Greek. 
As we consider what Paul is writing here, I, I can't help but to notice there in verse 5 where Paul's talking about how unrepentant people treasure up for themselves wrath in the day of wrath. Think about your own savings account when you have some extra money and, and uh, you know, you've paid off your bills and, and, and you don't need to spend it. What do you do? You, you treasure it. You store it away. You put it in your savings account so that you can use it later. And so every time you put some of your money into your savings account, you're treasuring it up so that you can use it later. Well, that's exactly what the unbeliever is doing. The unrepentant unbeliever who is living a life of sin is storing up or treasuring up wrath for the day of wrath. And on the day of the great white throne judgment, they're essentially cashing in on that account. And the Lord is going to give them everything that they stored up in that account. They're going to receive indignation and wrath and tribulation and anguish by their own choice. Because they chose to reject the free gift of grace that's received at the foot of the cross. Those who stand before the great white throne judgment of God will receive the righteous retribution of God, which is going to be a perfect punishment, which fits the crime. Now, I realize that there are many who insist that, oh, no, there's, there's no crime that we could commit here in this world uh, which should be punished with everlasting torment. Many will say this is cruel and unusual punishment, that the punishment does not fit the crime. And yet I would remind you that the unrepentant unbeliever at the end of the day is actually guilty of attempted deicide. Attempted deicide. Think about it for a moment. It's our sins that place Jesus on the cross. It's our sins that, that placed him there on that cross where he received the retribution that we deserve for our sins. And not only that, but the unbeliever is the one who is basically saying, not God's will, but my will. In that sense, they would just assume God just be dead to them so that they can sit upon their own throne. Our sins, it's nothing more than an attempt to get rid of God altogether. And isn't this just attempted deicide? Please understand that the everlasting torment which will come upon those who stand before the great white throne judgment of God, their torment will be fully deserved forevermore. I should also remind you that the scars of Christ's crucifixion will continue to be seen on the resurrected body of our Savior for the rest of time and eternity. In this way, the Son of God has forever been affected by the righteous retribution of the Father. He received those scars through the crucifixion on our behalf so that we could receive everlasting life through his shed blood. Therefore, I would argue that those who reject the redemption of our Savior Jesus, they're going to receive the wrath of the Father's retribution forevermore by their own choice. They're choosing to go to the one place that's left for rebellious people. It was created for the devil and his demons. We're talking about the lake of fire. But this will be the place where every unrepentant unbeliever ends up by their own choosing. And listen, the evidence of their eternal torment will be seen in the fact that the smoke of their torment will ascend forever and ever. It's for this reason that the Lord Jesus once declared, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, it's important to understand the word destroy here. Because it would be easy to say, well, you know, he's going to destroy the soul and the body in hell, therefore annihilation must be the case. But that word destroy doesn't speak of annihilation. It doesn't speak of a cessation of existence. Instead, it refers to something that is ruined to the point so that it is no longer useful for what it was originally created for. For example, if you've ever shattered a mirror, I, I had to stop looking at mirrors because I kept shattering them. But once a mirror has been shattered, the pieces still exist. 
The, the pieces don't just all of a sudden disappear from existence. The pieces of the mirror exist, and yet all the glue in the world will never restore those shards back into something that is useful as a mirror. That's what this word destroy means. The body and soul of the unrepentant unbeliever that ends up in the lake of fire, they still exist. It's just that their life will never be used for what it was originally intended for. Please understand that we were created to sing the praises of God. We were created to stand before his throne and proclaim his praises forevermore. Therefore, the person who ends up in the lake of fire because of their unbelief, they continue to exist. And yet, they're just not being used for what they were created for. The life of the unrepentant unbeliever will be destroyed by the righteous retribution of God. Now, as we begin to wrap up this study, you might be wondering, well, Bungie, how can you be so certain of these things? You, you, you can't see beyond the veil of, of life. How can you be so certain that this world is on a collision course with the great white throne of God? I'm glad you asked. I believe that there is good proof for what I'm saying. And in order to show you this proof, if you would turn with me now to the book of Acts, I'd like you to turn to Acts chapter 17 because it's in the 17th chapter of Acts where we find the apostle Paul. He's actually presenting the gospel message to a group of really, really smart thinkers. They're Grecian philosophers. And after hearing about the gospel message, they were looking for proof about the things that Paul was saying, and Paul presented them with the proof that they were requesting. With all this context in view, if you would look with me there at Acts 17, I want to begin reading at verse 30. Here Paul declares, Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. And notice, he has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. And he ended up having a couple of converts who followed him and that's great. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that Paul points to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ as the evidence that we are, in fact, heading towards the great white throne judgment of God. And listen, according to many scholars, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is one of the best attested facts of human history. Think about all the historical events that you believe in when George Washington floated across the, 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 the Delaware River or, or, or when Abraham Lincoln you know, made that famous speech and, and when Martin Luther King made his speech and, and when we landed on the moon and we can talk about all these different things that have happened in human history. And we believe these things because of the evidence that points us to these events. And yet, according to scholars, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is one of the best attested facts of human history. If you're gonna believe in any historical event, then you have to believe in the resurrection of Jesus because the believers reported the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the unbelievers reported about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the antagonists reported about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The historical evidence from the first and the second centuries proved to us beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Lord Jesus Christ has in fact risen up from the grave. And with that being the case, Jesus has proven himself to be the authority on what happens in the afterlife. I can't see past the veil of this world, but I know someone who can. And he's proven that he can because he died on a cross in our place, was buried, and on the third day rose up to prove that he is God incarnate. Therefore, it only makes sense for us to heed his warnings when he says, hey, fear him who can destroy the body and the soul in hell. We better take heed. Because what this means is that there's a hell. There is a lake of fire. 
And there will be those who will be destroyed there forevermore. How do I know? Because Jesus Christ rose up from the grave and that's what he said. Not only that, but the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ also proves that he is the one whom the Father has ordained to judge the world in righteousness. And so as we examine this prophecy, which I'll remind you is here within the revelation of the Lord Jesus, we quickly conclude then that the great white throne judgment will begin with a resurrection. The great white throne judgment will be followed by a time of retrospection as the wicked works of every unbeliever are examined. And the great white throne judgment will conclude with righteous retribution, which will be poured out upon every unrepentant unbeliever forever and ever. As we consider the gravity of this study, I'd like to leave you with some good news. Because these truths can weigh heavy on our hearts and and emotionally our heart breaks for those who don't yet know the Lord Jesus Christ. And sometimes believers can look at this and and, and fear thinking, oh no, I, I don't want to be judged for my works. And I'll remind you then that the great white throne judgment, it's for those who reject the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not for Christians. And while it's true that every unrepentant unbeliever will eventually stand before that terrible throne where their lives will be tried and found guilty, it's also true that those who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ today, well, we've been granted access to another throne. Unbelievers will eventually find themselves standing at the great white throne judgment, but believers today have been given access to the throne of grace. As a matter of fact, it's in Hebrews chapter four, verse 16, where Paul encourages every Christian by declaring this. He says, let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. Maybe you're a believer who recognizes that you need more grace in your life. Maybe you recognize that you need more mercy and maybe you find yourself in a time of need. And after hearing about the great white throne judgment, you're distressed out and worried. And I would just say, just just boldly enter into the throne room of grace. We've been given access to enter into that throne room and receive more grace upon more grace each and every day. The Lord has invited every Christian to spend time with him each and every day. And we do this through the privilege of prayer. And so with that, I want to conclude our study this morning by simply encouraging you, spend time each and every day at the throne of grace. Spend time in prayer seeking the Lord asking him to help you in your time of need. And also I would encourage you, spend time asking the Lord for a passion to reach the lost. Because every unrepentant unbeliever that we know right now is on a collision course with the great white throne judgment. Wouldn't it be better if they simply approached God at his throne of grace today? And I'm sure that every believer here today agrees it would be much better for all of our loved ones to simply approach the throne of grace and trust in Jesus Christ than to face him later as a judge at the great white throne judgment. Therefore, let's spend some time at the throne of grace praying for our unbelieving loved ones. And in that time of prayer, let's ask the Lord to help us to give us the grace that we need to go to those unbelievers and present them with the gospel of grace so that they might trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and thereby escape the great white throne judgment of God.